In this video, we are going to quickly take a look at the Union Budget 2017, which was presented by Mr. Arun Jaitley, the Finance Minister of India. Before we start with the highlights, let's gain some context. Why is there a budget? What is the purpose behind it? So if you look at the Constitution of India, Article 112 talks about annual financial statement and it is from here the parliament came up with what is commonly known as the Union Budget of India. And the reason we need a budget is to create a spending plan for the money the government collects in terms of tax. Because the amount of money that comes into the government of second largest populated country in the world is huge. And to spend that in a more appropriate and meaningful sense, we need a budget. While it's a different story when some sectors don't perform well, despite of giving more and more funds, but that's a whole different matter. Otherwise, the idea of the budget is to allocate funds appropriately and meaningfully. This time, the government of India decided to present the budget on the first day of February. Otherwise, till 2016, it was presented on the last working day of February. Now, the whole idea is to present the budget on the first day of Feb and make it come into effect from April 1, because April 1 is the start of India's financial year. So far, the budget has just been presented. That means the finance minister has introduced the budget in Lok Sabha by way of a speech. The same thing will be done in Rajya Sabha as well. After this, Lok Sabha takes up discussion on each ministry's expenditure proposals. The period that is given for this discussion is known as demand for grants. Both House of the Parliament discuss the budget, but only Lok Sabha gets to vote it. The appropriation bill is then introduced after all demands are passed. And once this appropriation bill is passed, the government receives authorization to draw from the consolidated fund. Once the appropriation bill becomes an act, the financial bill is passed. Once this is done, the final budget gets approved. Just a quick fact. The first ever Union Budget of India was presented by the first Finance Minister of India, R.K. Shanmukham Chetty, in 1947. Okay then, now that we have gained some context, let's look at the highlights of the Budget 2017. We will first look at the income tax lapse. So here are the income tax rate. If your earning is up to 2,50,000 in a year, you don't have to pay any tax. But then if your income lies in between 2,50,000 and 5 lakh, you have to pay 5% tax. And after that, we have 20% and 30%. And for senior citizens who are above 60 years and below 80 years, we have a little tax relaxation for them. Up to 3 lakhs, they don't have to pay any tax. And after that, they have to pay 5% and then followed by 20 and 30. And then senior citizens who are above 80 years, they don't have to pay any tax till 5 lakhs. And after 5 lakhs to 10 lakhs, they have to pay 20%. After that, they have 30%. And one thing to remember is that People whose income is above 50 lakhs or less than 1 crore, they have to pay a surcharge of 10%. Meaning, initially, if you see more than 10 lakhs, you have to pay 30% of tax, right? Now, you need to add this additional surcharge of 10% with the 30%. So that means 40% of your entire income will be taxed if you have an income above 50 lakhs and less than 1 crore. With the similar principle, if your income is more than 1 crore, then you have to pay a surcharge of 15%. So again, add this 15% with the 30% tax. So you'll have 45% of your entire income under tax bracket. This clearly means that the new tax lab has a big blow for the rich people. Now we will see what the budget has for the rural sector. The government has said that it will bring 1 crore households out of poverty by 2019. Now this plan will be executed under the already existing social scheme called Antyodaya. 2019 will also mark 150th birth anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi. Therefore it's a kind of special year to bring such a huge number of people out of poverty. During 2017-18, 5 lakh farm ponds will be taken up under the Manrega. So Manrega stands for Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Act. Under this act, the government will give employment to people by making them clean ponds and irrigation facilities, which can help farmers during the summer months. Manrega is a rural job guarantee scheme, therefore it makes total sense by giving a job to clean the ponds that will further help the farmers, so it's a win-win situation for both the side. Over rupees 3 lakh crore will be spent for rural India, Manrega to double farmers' income. By this point, the government means that it will address issues related to optimal utilization of water resources, create new infrastructure for irrigation, conserve soil fertility with balanced use of fertilizer and provide connectivity from farm to market. When all these issues are taken care, it is going to benefit the farmers and not to forget, many farmers come under the Manrega scheme of rural employment 
And in the previous point, we saw how there will be a win-win situation in overall development of the rural employment and the agricultural sector. The government has also said that it will take steps to ensure participation of women in Manrega up to 55%. So if you see currently, Puducherry tops the list in women representation in Manrega. 85% of total participation in Manrega in the state is that of women. The same happened in Andhra Pradesh where women participation is 54%. Now space technology will be used in a big way to ensure Manrega works. Now it's a well known fact that Manrega has always been under the scanner of large scale corruption and huge leakages. Therefore to take steps regarding that, the government will make use of geotagging which is a space technology with the use of satellite. It will track geographical locations to any data be it photo, received SMS messages, QR codes etc. This system will enable monitoring the flow of money for the scheme through a centralized electronic fund management system. So you see how technology will be used in transfer of funds in order to avoid leakages. The government proposes to complete 1 crore houses for those without homes. The present government has an objective called housing for all by 2022. So this is basically restructuring of an already existing UPA government initiative called Indira Avas Yojana into Pradhan Mantri Avas Yojana Grameen. In other words, India government is modifying the UP initiative under a different name. So through this Pradhan Mantri Avas Yojana Grameen, the government plans to complete 1 crore houses for the homeless. Government will also allocate Rs 19,000 crore for Pradhan Mantri Gram Sadak Yojana in 2017-18. Pradhan Mantri Gram Sadak Yojana is a rural roads program for rural development. This program runs together with the contribution from both the centre and states. It was launched in 2000 and so far 2,30,000 km of roads have been constructed. The aim of this project is to connect the 65,000 villages and habitations which are still unconnected by roads. The government also said that the country is well on way to achieve 100% rural electrification in March 2018. Piyush Goyal is the power minister. He was asked by Prime Minister Modi to target 200 villages every week and this plan was launched in 2015. The ministry had initially decided to electrify 18,452 villages within 1,000 days. Now the government has decided to electrify 7,000 villages by this year's March end. Swachh Bharat Mission has made tremendous progress. Sanitation coverage has gone up from 42% in October 2013 to 60% now. This particular objective has to go up after all. If you remember from November 2015, the government had imposed Swachh Bharat cess of 0.5% on all taxable services. So the whole idea is to use this amount for financing and promoting Swachh Bharat initiatives of the government. No wonder the sanitation coverage has gone up from 42 to 60%. So this was all the budget had for the rural economy. Now we will see what the budget has for the agriculture sector. A sum of rupees 10 lakh crore is allocated as credit to farmers with 60 days interest waiver. To make the agriculture growth reach 4.1% mark, the government allocated 10 lakh crore as credit, meaning farmers loan amount will increase and they also get an additional benefit of 60 days interest waiver, meaning 2 months of interest will not be charged. This will attract the farmers, particularly the small and marginal ones. Nabarth fund will be increased from 20,000 to 40,000 crore. The whole idea behind this is to generate employment and help in doubling farmers' income that will in turn increase focus on irrigation and dairy sector. Currently, the agriculture sector has lowest growth compared to other sectors in the economy. And if you see, we have only 2.4% of the world's total geographical area. Then being the second largest population, we make 18% of world's population. But then we have only 4% of the world's total fresh water resources. So that means efficiency in irrigation is the need for the R. That's why the fund has increased. Government will set up mini labs in Krishi Vigyan Kendras for soil testing. Krishi Vigyan Kendra KVK, is like an R&D center financed by the Indian Council of Agricultural Research. It caters the need of the farming community. Soil testing is done to determine the density, moisture, content and drying effects of the soil. This kind of scientific approach is required to increase the efficiency of irrigation. A dedicated micro-irrigation fund will be set up for Nabarth with 5000 crore initial corpus. 
Now micro irrigation industry is also called drip irrigation where the idea is to save water and fertilizer by allowing water to drip slowly to the roots of plant through a network of pipe, valves, tubes, etc. Since this industry is already working towards efficiency, therefore farmers expect timely and simplified implementation of the subsidy schemes. Again, it's a joint project between the center and state. Both give subsidy up to 50 to 100 percent in different states. Still, the industry and farmers are not happy with the implementation of these schemes. One of the problems they are facing is the government first tells the farmers to install the system and then apply for the subsidy. And it takes very long to clear proposals, which adversely affects the crop in terms of finances. Dairy Processing Infrastructure Fund will be initially created with a corpus of rupees 2000 crore. The existing infrastructure of the dairy sector has become old and obsolete. And we also know dairy sector is an example of cooperative sector. The cooperative sector do not have the funds to invest. So the government thought of creating a fund with 2000 crores initially and thereafter they will increase. This fund will be associated with Nabarth and it will help the rural economy with employment because dairy sector has a lot of people who come from rural background. Issuance of soil cards has gained momentum. Now soil health card is a very important scheme for farmers. This was launched in February 2015 by Prime Minister Modi for the welfare of farmers. There are many farmers who do not know the quality and the type of their soil. Soil card contains details about what kind of soil a farmer has, what can they grow and what measure they can take to improve. Soil card is issued once in every three years. So it's a good initiative and this has gained momentum. A model law on contract farming will be prepared and shared with the states. Now contract farming is basically a contract sort of a thing wherein a private company and a farmer comes into an agreement in production and supply of agricultural raw materials. It's a known fact that agriculture sector in India is kind of stagnant. Therefore, it needs a boost through private investment, though it has its own critics and disadvantages. But the government is in the mood of rolling out a law on contract farming. Now we will look at what the budget has for the energy sector. A strategic policy for crude reserves will be set up. India has a strategic plan to keep an emergency stockpile with millions of barrels of crude oil on the lines of the reserves. Just like how the US kept the reserves after the first oil crisis of 1973, India also wants to do something on that line. Currently, this reserve project has been set up in three locations. They are Vishakapatnam, Mangalore and Padur, which is in Kerala. Rupees 1,26,000 crore received as energy production based investment. When we say energy production, we are talking about solar power production. It is estimated that 26,000 megawatts of power will be generated with this investment. And primarily this was signed by the Rajasthan state government under the Rajasthan Solar Energy Policy 2014. So this was all about the allocation part for the energy sector in this budget. Now we will look at the plans in the financial sector. The FDI policy reforms more than 90% of FDI inflows are now automated. The foreign direct investment reforms in India has opened up sectors like defense, civil aviation, food, retail and pharmaceuticals to more investments and opening them up for complete foreign ownership. Earlier, FDI beyond 49% was permitted through approval route by the government under certain conditions. But now 90% is under automatic route, meaning there will be no government intervention. Shares of railway PSE like IRCTC will be listed on stock exchanges. The government wants the railway companies to be listed in stock markets so that these companies true market value will be unlocked. That means more revenue can be generated. This method will give these companies capacity to bear higher risks, take higher investment decisions and create more value for the stockholders. There will be a bill on resolution of financial firms will be introduced in this session of parliament. After that, we have foreign investment promotion board will be abolished. It is a government board that clears application on foreign direct investment in India. Moments back, we read that everything in FDI is going the automatic route up to 90%. In that case, there isn't room for a manual review board. Hence, the government is planning to shut it down. Revised mechanism to ensure time bound listing of CPSCs. CPSC is Central Public Sector Enterprises. They are also known as PSUs, which is Public Sector Undertaking. We have read earlier how the government plans on putting railway company shares on the stock market. 
The government also plans to do the same with other PSUs. Again, the whole idea is to unlock its true market value for taking big investment decisions. Computer Emergency Response Team for Financial Sector will be formed. Computer Emergency Response Teams are expert groups that handle computer security incidents. It comes under the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology. Their objective is handling cyber security incidents. Since now everything is going digital in the financial sector, there is a growing concern in terms of cyber security. Pradhan Mantri Mudra Yojana lending target fixed at Rs 2.44 crore for 2017-18. Do you remember the rupee card where the account holders can avail loans under Pradhan Mantri Mudra Yojana? The main idea is to give financial support to Dalits, tribals, backward classes, minorities and women in lending money so that they can come up with enterprises. They can avail loans at a lower interest rate. This acts as a step towards the upliftment of many backward communities. Digital India Bheem app will unleash mobile phone revolution. The government will introduce two schemes to promote Bheem app. Referral bonus for the users and cashback for the traders. Bheem stands for Bharat Interface for Money. It's an initiative taken by Prime Minister Modi to make cashless India. As a user, government will give incentive in terms of referral bonus, meaning you refer someone and you get some bonus point. And if you are a trader, you will get some cashback. It is just like Uber Ola apps giving incentives to make more and more people use the app. Negotiable Instruments Act might be amended. The Negotiable Instruments Act 1881, it is an act to define in law relating to negotiable instruments, which is promissory notes, bills of exchange and checks. So the government looks forward to amend it. DBT to LPG consumers, Chandigarh is kerosene free, 84 government schemes are on the DBT platform. Now DBT stands for direct benefit transfer. When you book your LPG, you get some amount transferred back to your bank account. The amount is the subsidy on LPG cylinders. Currently, there are 84 such government schemes wherein the subsidy amount is being transferred back to the beneficiary's account. These include education, health, fertilizer, power, oil, food grains, kerosene, LPG, etc. Head post office will be the central office for rendering passport services. The government has decided to make the head post office deliver passport related services. It is to increase citizens access to passport services, particularly in remote regions. Easy online booking system for army and other defense personnel. E-ticketing or online reservation system will be available for the defense personnel with some discounts and offers. It's a benefit given to the defense personnel keeping in mind their service towards the nation. For big time offenses including economic offenders fleeing India, the government will introduce legislative changes or introduce law to confiscate the assets of these people within the country. Needless to say, this particular point has been directed towards the actions of Vijay Malia. So going forward, the government will roll out some laws related to it. So this was everything the finance minister spoke in this budget about financial sector. Now we will look at the fiscal situation of a country. The total expenditure is Rs 21,47,000 crore. Now you must be thinking, where is this money coming and going? These are the sectors that gets its allocation from the Consolidated Fund of India. We call it as government expenditure. And the money comes from all these sources. We also call them government earnings. Pause and have a look at it. Plan, non-plan expenditure to be abolished. Focus will be on capital expenditure, which will be 25.4%. Non-plan expenditure is a running expense, mainly includes salary payments to government employees, defense, loans to public enterprises, social services, police, pension, loans to states, union territories, and foreign governments. And planned expenditure are those which goes behind funding the five-year plans that the government makes. So basically, the government is saying they want to abolish plan and non-plan expenditure. Instead, they want to focus on capital expenditure, which is creating assets, acquiring capital assets. It's more of a long-time point of view. The expenditure for science and technology is Rs 37,435 crore. Under this, Department of Space and Department of Atomic Energy got the maximum allocation. Department of Space showed success with its projects like Mars Orbiter Mission and Department of Atomic Energy is showing success in nuclear power projects. Total resources transferred to state and union territories is Rs 4.11 lakh crore. When we say total resources, we mean financial resources. And these transfers include share of taxes, grants in aid, loans and many other centre-state sponsored schemes. 
recommend a 3% fiscal deficit for 3 years with a deviation of 0.5% of the GDP. Now fiscal deficit means debt. When a government spends more than it actually earns, that's what is called fiscal deficit. And it gets added year after year. Currently India has a 3% fiscal deficit. 3% of what? It is 3% of GDP. Take the GDP and do 3% on it. Back in 2009, India had 6% fiscal deficit and bringing it down to 3% is what the government is proposing. Then the revenue deficit is 1.9%. Revenue deficit is the difference between the revenue expenditure and the revenue receipts. In simple terms, it is the amount of money that is spent minus the amount of money that is required, meaning there is a shortfall. That is what is revenue deficit. Currently it is at 1.9% meaning there is a shortfall. More revenue is needed. Now fiscal deficit of 2017-18 is pegged at 3.2% of the GDP. The government will remain committed to achieving 3% in the next year. We just read about it moments back. Less fiscal deficit is good for the nation because always spending should be lesser than income. So this was all about the fiscal situation of a country. Now coming to the funding on political parties. The maximum amount of cash donation for a political party will be Rs 2000 from any one source. This is an important step towards bringing transparency in political funding because these are the major avenues of black money. So any donation beyond Rs 2000, rupees, the party will have to disclose the identity of the donor. Previously 20,000 was the limit for anonymous cash donation. Political parties will be entitled to receive donations by check or digital mode from donors. Here the RBI will play an important role in bringing transparency in political fundings because any digital mode of transaction will reveal the identity of the donor and this is what is transparency. An amendment is being proposed to the RBI Act to enable issuance of electoral bonds. A donor can purchase these bonds from banks or post offices through check or digital transactions. They can be redeemed only by registered political parties. It is like the demand draft system. You pay at the bank and get that bond, certificate, whatever, and give that to the political party. They will redeem that bond or certificate you gave in exchange of money. This way, there will be a nice balance and check on the funding part. So these were some of the steps that the government took towards controlling the funding on political parties. Now we will look at the railway budget. This is the first time railway budget has been included and it will continue to be so hereafter. A total allocation for railways is Rs 1,31,000 crore, which is 1.31 trillion rupees. This amount is for the development of the structures, systems and facilities. Indian Railways is among the world's largest rail networks, therefore the cost of its development has to be this high. No service charge on tickets booked through IRCTC. This move is basically to incentivize cashless transactions through online booking, you know encouraging more and more people to book tickets online. Raksha coach with a corpus of Rs 1 lakh crore for 5 years for passenger safety. Recent cases of accidents leading to heavy casualties has highlighted the need for creation of passenger safety fund by carrying out necessary upgrades and development to enhance safety of passengers. Then the government has decided to eliminate unmanned level crossing by 2020. To reduce accidents, railways will eliminate over 6000 unmanned level crossings. In India, unmanned level crossings has been such a huge problem, killing many people. 3,500 km of railway lines to be commissioned this year, up from 2,800 km last year. Indian Railways is amongst the largest rail networks in the world. Every year, the railway sets a target distance for laying new railway lines. The target distance has increased this time. SMS-based Clean My Coach service is put in place. Send SMS to 5888 if your train coach needs cleaning. There is a website dedicated to it, cleanmycoach.com. Go there and have a look at it. Coach Mitra facility will be introduced to register all coach related complaints. Now solving customer grievances, government has introduced Coach Mitra facility wherein all the complaints related to train coaches are addressed and resolved. By 2019, all trains will have bio toilets. This technology is interesting. Bio toilet system utilizes anaerobic bacteria which consumes the waste material and converts it into water and gas. The water is passed through a chlorine tank and is discharged as clean water on the tracks while the gas evaporates. 
The bacteria is from Antarctica and it is mixed with cow dung because then it multiplies its ability to biodigest human excreta and waste. 500 stations will be made differently abled friendly. By installing facilities like separate dropping zone, parking area, special toilets, bathrooms, field chairs and a ramp of easy entry and exit are some of the services that will be installed. Railways to partner with logistic players for front-end and back-end solutions for select commodities. Indian Railways exploring tie-ups with e-commerce companies to become logistics partners for parcel delivery business. Companies like Amazon, Flipkart and Snapdeal are in talks with the railways. These companies have huge warehouses to store the products and they can reach small towns and rural areas. The same thing can be said about the railways too. In fact, they both can benefit from each other. These companies will have access to train passengers so that they can sell products on train. There's a lot of potential in terms of revenue and it's a win-win situation for both the parties. New Metro Rail policy will be announced with new modes of financing. This new policy is expected to generate new jobs for the youth. So these are some highlights of the Railway Budget 2017. Now we'll see about the healthcare for poor and underprivileged. Rupees 500 crore has been allocated for Mahila Shakti Kendras. Mahila Shakti Kendra is a support service for empowering rural women with opportunities for skill development, employment, health, maternity benefit, nutrition and digital literacy. Under a nationwide scheme for pregnant women, rupees 6000 will be transferred to each person. Now this scheme is an effort towards bringing down the maternal mortality rate by providing pregnant women financial aid of rupees 6000. The money will be directly transferred to pregnant women's bank accounts. Currently, the scheme is being implemented on a pilot basis in 53 districts, with the benefit amount being rupees 4000. A sum of rupees 1,84,632 crore has been allocated for women and children. Budget for women and children welfare has been increased from 1,56,528 crores to 1,84,632 crores. And this is done by setting up of uh, Mahila Shakti Kendra at village level, then Beti Bachao Beti Padao Yojana, then transferring 6,000 rupees to pregnant women's account. All these schemes come under Women and Children Welfare Department. Owing to surplus liquidity, banks have started reducing lending rates for housing. Because of demonetization, banks have excess liquidity, meaning they have more money than usually required for any bank. This will make housing loans affordable. That will increase the demand for housing, which in turn will increase accessibility, connectivity and job creation, which is well for the nation's economy. The government is determined towards elimination of tuberculosis by 2025. Tuberculosis is an ancient disease that silently kills many people every day. Government's intention is to eliminate five chronic diseases that affect poor people. They are Kalazar, Filariasis, Leprosy, Measles and Tuberculosis. Out of all these five, tuberculosis is the most dangerous and difficult to tackle. For that, money has to be allocated. India is currently the world highest TB burden nation. Therefore, the health ministry is now formulating a new action plan to combat tuberculosis. 1.5 lakh health sub-centers will be transformed into health wellness centers. The Department of Ayurveda, Yoga and Naturopathy, Unani Siddha and Homeopathy, which is commonly known as Ayush, is a governmental body in India proposed with developing education and research in Ayurveda, Yoga, Naturopathy, Unani, Siddha and Homeopathy. The whole idea is to cure diseases and illness not just with allopathy, which is medicines, but also through methods mentioned in Ayush. All taluk hospitals will have an Ayush doctor as well as an allopathic doctor. Two aims will be set up in Jharkhand and Gujarat. The government has targeted to eliminate Kala Azar by 2017, Leprosy by 2018 and Tuberculosis by 2020 as part of the health policies. In regards to that, two more aims will be set up as part of increasing healthcare in the country. Government will undertake structural transformation of the regulator framework for medical education. In order to give the much needed boost to healthcare, government is committed towards structural transformation of medical education. Right now, getting a PG seat in medicals is quite messy and complicated. So the government is committed towards adding 5,000 additional postgraduate seats per annum to ensure adequate availability of doctors in healthcare institutions. Allocation for scheduled caste welfare has been increased by Rs. 52,393 crore. 
it is 35% more than what it was in the previous year. This investment will be introduced based on outcome and monitoring expenditure by Niti Aayog. So the money isn't going easy, there is checks and balance. Aadhaar-based smart cards will be issued to senior citizens to monitor health. Aadhaar-based smart cards will contain their health details and based on these details, LIC, which is another government body, will implement schemes for senior citizens to provide assured pension and other benefits. So these were all the plans which this year's budget had for the poor and underprivileged sections. Now in the end, we are going to talk about demonetization. So you can see these are the highlighted points about demonetization. So the government is saying that this move that is demonetization will be good for next year's fiscal year, which will help the economy grow above 7%. Because now many people have accepted digital transactions after demonetization. Of course, the period during the move was very painful, but now we no longer see queues outside bank branches for cash. And keeping in mind all the huge investments that we spoke about in this video, it is going to boost economic growth. All the public investments announced by the government will have a multiplier effect. It will have great impact in lives of people because always there used to be an official amount and an unofficial amount for property, tax paying, etc. Now with this huge amount of black money going out of the window, the price of real estate and tax evasion is going to fall which is good for both the economy as well as an individual. So this year's budget was largely focused on increased public expenditure, especially in the rural sectors and on public infrastructure. If you want to see more of such educational content, make sure you're subscribed. By doing so, you'll get an alert when my next video comes. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.